Start recording. Okay, so let's finish up these slides on game theory. Last time we talked about the prisoner's dilemma, do you remember that? Where, I mean, if they could both cooperate with each other and coordinate, they could both walk out of jail without any, like, without having spent any time there at all. If only they could just both not confess, but they cannot tell what the other one's going to do. And so we have discovered that the Pareto, or sorry, the Nash equilibrium told us that the optimal outcome for those prisoners who couldn't tell what they could do, like they just know that like, they'll be in this state or the other state, depending on whether they confess or whether they don't confess because they have no control over their, uh, their accomplice, uh, we notice that it's better to just confess. On average, you'll spend less time in jail, assuming you have no knowledge of what your partner's doing. Okay, so that is why that is the better option. Now we know. Let's keep on trucking with a few other game theory uh, problems. So the next problem is called cake cutting. Maybe you've played this with a sibling before, but uh, you don't have to tell me, sadly, if this was a cooperative game or a non-cooperative game, because you can think of it from both perspective, uh, from either perspective, I think. Uh, cooperative because you're both sharing the cake. Uh, Non-cooperative because, I don't know, if your opponent is like a two-year-old, maybe they will accidentally give you the most cake anyway. I'm not sure. Uh, but the cooperation is kind of forced upon you. So maybe it isn't really cooperative. You're kind of backed into a corner in order to become cooperative. Remember that a cooperative game means that forming an alliance is a good thing. Alliances equals good. Okay, so here's the cake cutting game, right? Maybe you've played this before. Uh, one person gets the knife and they get to cut the cake, right? But then the other person gets to choose which piece they want, and so that's how you make it fair. So what is the optimal strategy for this game? You got your cake. It's definitely best to cut it in half, right? Cut that cake perfectly in half, because if you did a good job, you know that probably the person who gets to pick the piece is going to take the biggest one, and if there is no bigger one, then you both get the same amount. You get the most amount if you cut the cake perfectly in half, right? Because if you were to be stingy and forget that you're not the one who gets to pick which piece they want first, if you accidentally cut the cake like this, right? Something like that. The person who gets to pick, right, not you, they're probably going to pick this giant piece, right? They're going to take this piece from you. And you'll be left with the smaller one. So, it behooves you to pick the uh, pick the cake cutting that's going to give you the most. Okay? Right in half. All right? Don't be stingy. That's cake cutting. Have we played that before? There's actually some fancy mathematical uh, results on this, like if there's multiple people playing this game together. Like there's a bunch a bunch of different people get to uh, cut the cake, and then they, start get to pick, they get to pick which pieces they want in some order. This is still not an, uh, this is still a, a fancy problem that takes a research paper to solve these days. But at least the, the two-player cake cutting game makes a little bit of sense. So... Uh, Let's talk about cake cutting and other things in terms of a new concept called Pareto optimality. Okay, so uh, cake cutting can be talked about through the lens of Pareto opt optimality, so that's why it's on the next slide. Um, we can talk about any sort of generic resource allocation, like giving out money, giving out cake, in terms of this idea. So a resource allocation, it's Pareto optimal, we say. When, if you were to change that allocation, make it smaller, make it bigger, always leave somebody worse off. Okay? So it's a very utilitarian idea. Mill would like this. Uh, let's think about what are some Pareto optimal allocations for cake cutting. Which kinds of cuttings of the cake would leave somebody worse off if you changed how you cut it? So here's the, here's the stingy example, right? So here's the original cake cutting, those two pieces. 
let's say we changed it a little bit. Like instead, like here was the edge of the outermost piece now, okay? It was all of this. So we changed it a little bit. Is somebody worse off? Yeah. The person who's going to take the bigger piece is now worse off. Does that make sense? So technically, this stingy cake cutting was Pareto optimal, according to the definition, which is fun to think about. Uh, cutting the cake in half, also Pareto optimal, right? If you cut the cake in half, perfectly like that, if you change that allocation a little bit, like you cut it a little bit more over here, the person who uh, gets to choose second, the, the cake cutter, right, is a little worse off because they're getting the smaller piece now. Does that make sense? So actually, no matter what you do in this cake cutting game, uh, every outcome is Pareto optimal. Every allocation is Pareto optimal, which is fun, uh, which is a bit weird to think about. So that doesn't give you the whole story. Uh, but usually we think of Pareto optimal as fair. This idea, this is a, a nice idea, a nice definition of fairness. If you change how you give out things, how you dole out your money or your cake, it leaves somebody worse off. That means that the, the original resource allocation, that original arrangement was optimal for some sense of optimal. So that's a nice thing that you'd like to have. Uh, it is a fun term. And this actually, this, this word, allows us to explain why, why this prisoner's dilemma felt so wrong. Why it didn't seem like the right answer. Like, why can't they just both not confess, right? It's because it was not a Pareto optimal outcome. The prisoner's dilemma, the Nash equilibrium, which was what was going to happen, it was an equilibrium, it was not Pareto optimal. And so that's probably why, as humans, we thought that it didn't make a lot of sense, why it was counterintuitive. The Nash equilibrium does not have to match the Pareto optimal outcome. So that's probably why it's so fuzzy in our brain. Uh, because, watch, what is an allocation of confessing and non confessing that's better than this one? Right? It's, yeah, if you change it to here, everybody's better off. Nobody's worse off, everybody's better off. So that means this original Nash equilibrium was not a Pareto optimal outcome. This one was. But it still won't happen. And so that's why it was counterintuitive. And so that's a, that's a nice little term. The resource allocation is Pareto optimal when changing the allocation always leaves somebody worse off. That is a very nice uh, definition of fairness, I think. Any questions about that? Are we now hungry for cake? All right, uh, I have a couple more examples before we get to the other slides. I'll we'll actually do a little programming today, too, I think. So uh, here's another game. If you go and get an Uber or a Lyft with somebody, uh, and this, uh, and, and you're like struggling to figure out who gets to pay what, here is how you can split your fares. So here is uh, how to solve the fare taxi rides problem, OK? So this is a cooperative game. It makes a lot of sense to form an alliance. Here's the setup. Uh, I don't know. Here is person A and person B to make it fun. In computer science, we say that person A's name is Alice and person B's name is Bob. And they both want to go home. They had a fun night out. And they order a little taxi. Here's the taxi. I have a very bad drawing of the taxi. I'll fix that. He comes, picks them up. Boop. Good enough. So there it is. And uh, it just so happens that Alice lives on the way to Bob's house. Boop, boop, boop. So here's a bunch of streets. Here is Alice's house on the way. And here is Bob's house uh, at the very end of the journey. All right. So that's the setup. Uh, so of course they're going to share a taxi. It's cheaper that way, in theory. Uh, so... Here's the idea, because they live on the same uh, route home. If Alice went and got a taxi by herself, she would pay $5, because she's closer, right? If Bob went and got a taxi, taxi by himself, he'd pay $12, because his house is farther away, right? So uh, it makes no sense for them to get in separate taxis, right? 
because that would be like $17 total among both of them. If they both get in the same taxi, the fare is going to be the same price as going to Bob's house, because Alice can just hop out on the way. It'll still be $12 for both of them together, right? So definitely better to take the taxi together. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that, like, paying $6, like, asking Alice to pay $6 and asking Bob to pay $6 is not very fair for Alice. Six and six is not fair. Especially because Alice could have just taken a cab herself and paid five dollars. Okay, so six dollars not, is not the answer. Uh, so let's figure out what the answer is. What should Alice be paying when she rides in this taxi together with Bob? This is a nice, useful example, right? If you, you take an Uber home with somebody and they live on the way. So the question is, how much should Alice pay to fairly split the bill with Bob? And the fancy technical game theoretic term we're looking at, we're looking for, is called the shapely value. All right, that's going to give us the answer. All right, so we're going to determine the shapely value for this uh, for this game, which is a taxi ride, a shared taxi ride. So the idea is the way to determine this fancy shapely value and compute what Alice should pay and how much Bob should pay is you consider, you think about all the different ways of paying, and Ways, uh, the technical term for that is permutations, right? So consider all the permutations of who pays the remaining bill in what order, based on their original prices. Uh, and then you take the average of those. So there's going to be another average calculation going on, just like when we were determining the Nash equilibrium. All right? So let me show you the uh, idea here. So what are the two permutations that could take place here, like of who's, who pays first? So either Alice pays first, then Pop Bob pays second, right? Alice, then Bob. Or Bob pays first, and Alice pays second. Right? It's a very simple idea, but this is going to give us the answer. Uh, so if it's this order, everybody pays how much would how much their normal fare would be or whatever's left, if it's less. So if Alice gets to pay first, she'll pay $5, right? Because that's her, her cab fare. And then if Bob pays second, right, remember the total is 12 between the both of them, Bob would pay $7, that's what's left over, okay? Not very fair for Alice in this arrangement, but that's okay. We're going to average them. Second, if Bob pays first, if he pays his fare first, then he'd pay $12 total, right? And then if Alice had to go second and pay the remaining fare, there's nothing left to pay. So Alice would pay $0 in this permutation of who pays the remaining bill in what order idea, but it's going to give us the answer. So uh, let's determine it from Alice's point of view. So Alice's cost, so maybe I'll do that in green so that we can see through the dotted lines. This will give us our fair share for Alice and Bob. Alice cost. Boop. So if Alice went first here, she's paying $5. Otherwise, if she's going second, she's paying $0. And what we'd like to do is average this. Average, boop, boop. that is 250. All right, so that is the shapely value. That is the correct fare. That's the fair fare to pay uh, if you're Alice. Okay, so if you have Alice pay 250 and Bob pay the rest, so 950, that would be an evenly split bill according to this particular uh, idea of shapely value. That seems pretty fair, right? So you can play this game with three people in the car as well if they all live on the way home. You can just do a bunch of averages. You'd have to consider multiple permutations, right? There's six permutations of three people. But that's the game you can play, and you can get a perfectly fair, for this sense of the word, result. Okay, any questions about that? So Alice should pay 250 here, according to this idea. Which is a win-win for both of them. Definitely not six dollars. Two fifty sounds good. We good with that idea? It's just a fun uh, example for math. All right, my final example is probably the coolest. Uh, I cannot teach it to you. If you, I think in CSI twenty six, I gave this example and I actually write the program to do it. But I'll just show you the example here. You can make a perfectly correct tic-tac-toe playing 
algorithm this way. It's called the algorithm is called Minimax, and you can always win tic tac toe with it, or you'll always play accurately. You'll, you might get a, a, a tie, right? Sometimes. But it will find the optimal strategy to play this game if you search for the right answer with this algorithm called Minimax. I'll teach it to you so you can do it by hand if you'd like. But here's how you can always win tic-tac-toe. What you do is uh, you start with your current board position. If it's empty, maybe this is your current board. And then you think about all the different ways that the game could be played. And there's many, right? There's a lot of different ways that it could branch. Uh, but you have to think about them, right? How can we figure out the best move to play? Well, let's just play every move, okay? Simulate the entire rest of the game. Because here's what could happen, right? Maybe you make a move and the game board looks like this, right? Or you make a move and the game board looks like this. Or you make a move and the game board looks like this, or this, or this. There's a many, many different ways to choose, if it's uh, X's turn right now or something. And then from there, from those new places, like X move, now it's O's turn. Maybe there's only one option for O there. Maybe there's two options from this one for X and O. And there's, there's just a bunch of uh, ways to go down and play the rest of the game. What you do is you try all of them, right? There's not infinitely many. There's like, it's either, every square is either blank, X, or O. So it's like three to the ninth possibilities somewhere arranged in some hierarchy. So that's a finite number. You can try them all. Uh, but that's what you do. You simulate the rest of the game, and here is how you find the best move. Play Minimax. So uh, this this fancy, this silly word has both min and max in it, and so you're going to do both. And I'll show you how. So when it's our turn, say we're X or something. When it's our turn, we want to we want to make the move that maximizes our chance of winning, right? Because it's our we're X. We want to win. So maybe if it's X's turn right now, we want to try and maximize our chance of winning given the results from every other possibility, all right? And then when we go and simulate, right? Then when we go and simulate, if it's O's turn, right? Maybe X moves, and then below that, it's O's turn. X can't move again in tic-tac-toe. Can't move twice in a row. When it's your opponent's turn, and you're simulating that row of all the possibilities, right? You, get, you must assume that O is playing to win as well, right? Assume that they're going to make the move that minimizes your chance of winning. You see that? So it's max when it's from your perspective, if you're X, for example. You're trying to maximize your chance of winning. And then when it's O's turn and you're trying to simulate the game for their move, you pretend that they're going to also play to win and they're going to try and minimize your chance of winning. Okay? So you assume that your opponent's a really good one. Technically, you can kind of beat Minimax, maybe, if uh, you were a bad opponent. But, yeah. You maximize it when it's your turn, minimize it when it's their turn, minimize your outcome when it's their turn, and that will give you how you should play the game to fend off the attacks from that very good other player. That's the idea. So, uh, yeah, let me show you uh, how to solve this game, but I'd like you to try it first. Please, uh, please try to uh, get together as a group and write down open up paint or get out a piece of paper. See if you can figure out all the ways that this game could be played. All right, let's pretend it's X's turn. Make a chart of all the different ways that you could play the game from this particular point, all right? Pretend that it's X's turn. So let me give you one option. So one way that the game could be played from here, right, is, well, if it's X's turn, X can go in any empty spot. Let's pretend that X goes in this spot. All right, so now it's going to be that one. That's everything that was there before. X, O, 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 X, X. And if X goes here, the game will now look like this, but there's several other options. So please fill in those. And then uh, if you'd like, fill in O's moves as well, because maybe like if, if the game looks like this, now it's O's turn, now O could maybe go here. That's one option. It's a bad option for O, but they could do it. X, O, O, X, O, they went here, now it's the O there, then X, X. And then there's more possibilities there. So fill in as much as this, uh, as much of this game chart as you can. It's really a tree, if you've heard that term before. It's a game tree. Uh, and then I will show you how to solve from this tree the
correct best move for x, which I think you can imagine it's going to be the winning move, right? But I'll show you how to calculate that without any other knowledge. So try to fill in the tree. I'll give you a couple minutes, and that'll be that. Show you how I might do it. Any questions as we were figuring this out? All right. So, yeah, if that's our start, our starting board is this one. I'll have to do it very small. If this is x, o, o, x. I'm sorry, o. I think there's three options, right? X could go here, here, or here. And I should have just drawn X's instead of O's. That's a little confusing. But yeah, you have three ways to play the game from there. Let's try and draw the rest. Oh, I sure hope I can do this. Oh man, almost. If I use my arrow keys, there we go, that'll do it. One more time. Honestly, it might have been faster to just draw it, but I don't care. Whee! Good enough. So X could have gone here, here, 
or here, right? That's the idea. And uh, I guess for fun, let's let's put the winning one in the middle so that I can. So I could have gone here, here, or here, so like that. And then you can play the game from the rest of that point, uh, from that point onward. So if uh, if you're here, that means it's O's move, right? If X just moved, it's O's turn now. There's two options. O could go here, or here. So two options there. I guess uh, I should draw them. That's probably faster to just write them out. It was X, O, O, X, O, X, 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 O, O, X, O, X, X. And then O could have gone either. Let's see here. X, o could have gone here or here, all right? And then let's do this one. What is the final way to do it? There's only one way for X to move now, if it's X's turn after O moved. They just won in two different ways, right? X, O, O, X, X, and then X one last time. Okay? So, uh, this game is over, there's nothing left. This game is over, there's nothing left. Oh, one. This game is over, there's nothing left. Now I just need to play the rightmost one. So now it's O's turn. And then one more. So X, O, 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 X, 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 O, 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 X, X, X. And so O could have gone either here or here. And then finally, if O went here, there's one last move to play with X, and then X wins. X, O, O, O. X, 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 right? And then we've made it to ending states where either X wins or O wins, right? So that is all the different ways that the game could be played. Are there any questions about that? Is that what we came up with? All right. So now the, the question is, how do you do Minimax? How do you determine, like, what's the best way to play the game from here onwards? What you do is you score. You give a numerical score to every game state, all right? And you usually start from the bottom. Uh, let's say that the score is positive 1 if X wins, uh, negative 1 if O wins, because we want low scores for O, right? We want to maximize our score for X, so we'll do it from our perspective positive one if we win, negative one if we lose, and then if it's a tie, just call it zero or something. But here's how you do it. You start from the edge, from the ends of the game. So this, this game's over x1, so we'll score that as plus one. This game is over with uh, o1, we'll, we'll score that as a negative one. All right? And then the rest is as you would expect. This is plus one, this is minus one, and then when you work your way upwards, like you determine what's the score for this one, well, remember uh, what's going on. This is uh, this is O's move right here. They're going to try and... Uh, oh, sorry, this is X's move right now. We'd like to maximize our score from here. So we're going to take the maximum among all of the things that we have to choose from. And there's just one. It's positive one. So we, we maximize here. O is going to minimize. If it's their turn, so from this circled moves perspective, it's O's turn, they're going to minimize their score. And so they're going to pick, uh, they're going to minimize our score, sorry. So they're going to pick this route. They're going to win the game if they choose this one, right? They're never going to let it go here. They're going to try and win, so they're going to choose this one. And so we should say that the score for this whole board, this more empty board, is negative one, right? Because O is going to pick the move that's going to minimize our score, right? This one we win. So we'll call it uh, positive one, right? And then uh, this one, it's X's turn again. You maximize the score there, positive one, just comes up. Now when you have options, it depends on whose turn it is. So it's O's turn for this move. They're going to minimize our score, so they're going to pick this route and win the game. So they're definitely going to pick the minus one route. And then here, this original game board, we're ready to score it. 
and figure out what we should do. We're going to maximize our score, right? So we maximize our score among all of these possibilities. It's got to be this one, right? So it's going to be positive one. And why? This also gives you the move to play. It's saying, all right, pick the one that's going to maximize your score when it's your turn. It's exactly this one. All right, and that's going to be the move that we play. And we immediately win the game. But that is the generic algorithm to always determine the best current move, even if you're not one step away from winning. Isn't that cool? Any questions about that? All right, that's the idea. So uh, I have one next set of slides to do. A few more uh, slides to go. These are on recursion and beauty. I don't know if we're going to get to beauty, but we're definitely going to get to recursion. Recursion is a very wonderful concept that I would like to teach you. So the idea of recursion is you have a problem that you're solving, and you're solving that problem in terms of itself. So you find that problem inside of itself somehow. It's very weird to think about. Uh, but by doing that, by seeing the problem inside of itself and solving that one, and then using that to solve the original problem, you will come up with the answer. That might seem wrong, right? It might seem like circular reasoning. Why can? Why is that at all possible, right? How can you solve a problem in terms of itself? Haven't you just gone back around to where you started and not done anything? Well, the answer is no. There, are, uh, you can think of it as a bunch of different ways, but recursion involves solving a smaller version of your current problem. So, like Russian stacking dolls. Sm slightly smaller doll inside of a slightly smaller doll, or slightly bigger doll, etc., etc., until there's a smallest one, right? That is going to be the way we solve problems with recursion. As long as the problem gets smaller, you'll eventually get at the answer. And here's the idea. You're going to solve a problem in terms of smaller versions of itself, okay? So here's what you do. Here's how you do it. So, uh, first of all, you need to notice that this is a recursively solvable problem. You've got to find, the, find a problem and make sure it has itself inside of itself. That's sometimes hard to discover, but you, you can do it. Uh, once you find a smaller problem, it's called a sub-problem, by the way, you can use its answer. You can use the answer to that smaller sub-problem to solve the original biggest problem that you were originally working on. Okay? This is all vague and it makes not a lot of sense, but it will with an example, I promise. So here's like your original problem. Your problem is a box. You find a smaller version of that same problem inside of itself. So you find another box inside of that box, right? You solve it. And then you can use that smaller box's solution to solve the original problem somehow, right? You use the small box to solve the big box. That's the idea. You also get to assume that you can solve the small box as well, which is just really cool and magical to think about. But I'm going to show you recursion as an example with probably, uh, this is probably the standard example, the quintessential example of recursion. It's factorial, all right? So factorial is a recursive problem. Do we know what factorial is, by the way? 5 factorial, for example, is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So I claim that finding the factorial of a number is a recursive problem. So that involves uh, solving it inside of itself. Can you find, as a group, I'll give you a minute to think about it, can you find a smaller factorial inside of 5 factorial? Take a minute to think about it. See if you can help each other notice it. There might be multiple answers, but can you find factorials, one or more, inside of 5 factorial? Because that's going to be the start of this game.
All right, do we see it? Where's the where's this where's a smaller factorial? Can anybody tell me? Which one is it? Two. If five. Does everybody see 4 factorial inside of 5 factorial? Because 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. There it is. So there's 4 factorial. Are there any other factorials in here? There's plenty, right? There's 3 factorial. 3 factorial. Here's 2 factorial. 2 factorial. Now, this is also 1 factorial. Why not? One factorial. That's there. They're all there. But usually when you're solving a recursive problem, you want to find the next smaller one. So four factorial is the right one to see. And from there, you can build an answer to any factorial problem. All right? We've just noticed that this is a recursive problem. We can find it inside of itself. And that we had to try some examples, right? Can you find a smaller factorial inside of five factorial? Yes. Yes, we can. Five factorial, we determined. Five times four times three times two times one, there's four factorial inside of it. How do we use that to find the final answer, right? If you had four factorial, how would you build five factorial? Well, five factorial is five times four factorial. Do we see that? That's just a rearrangement of all the ideas we've just said so far. And what do you know? This is a smaller factorial finding problem. Those are all the pieces you need to see. A smaller factorial And that will allow us to always make it work. And now the question is, we, not, we have to generalize it. This generalizes to most numbers, right? So like 7 factorial. The same idea holds, right? 7 factorial is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. There is 6 factorial hiding inside of 7 factorial. So 7 factorial is 7 times 6 factorial. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 factorial. We can generalize that. How do you calculate n factorial then? Or just an arbitrary number n. n factorial, following this pattern, right? n factorial is equal to, well, pretend 5 is n. It's equal to n, right? n times, and how do you get 4 from 5 if 5 is n? n times n minus 1 factorial. That's the general rule. You see that? That's going to be the first part. That's how we do it. All right. So we can define the factorial problem in terms of smaller versions of itself. And this, where you have a smaller factorial inside of the bigger factorial, this is called the recursive case of the problem. You actually need one more way to... You need one more case to solve the, the thing entirely, and that's called the base case. You need a way to stop, okay? Because this, this seems like an infinite equality that would go on forever. Uh, we need a way to stop our computation and be done with it. So in addition to the recursive case, we need a stopping condition called the base case. And to figure out what the base case should be, you always ask the question, like, when do I immediately know the answer for fact? I don't have to compute any smaller factorials. When do I know the answer? Right now. And we can try and discover that. So 5 factorial, if we keep solving our recursive case problem, let's keep using that answer until it stops making sense. 5 factorial equals, well, according to our rule, that's 5 times 4 factorial. That checks out. What's 4 factorial? That's 4 times 3 factorial. What's 3 factorial? That's 3 times 2 factorial. Yeah, that still makes sense. What's 2 factorial? That's 2 times 1 factorial. What's 1 factorial? That's uh, 1 times 0 factorial. That's actually defined to be 1, which still works, surprisingly. Uh, what's 0 factorial? That is 0 times negative 1 factorial, which makes the whole answer 0. I think we should have stopped before that, right? That's going to be the problem. There is no negative factorial anyway. Uh, we, should have, we definitely should have stopped before then. You can stop at 0 factorial if you'd like. That's defined to be 1. But I think that might seem a little scary to us. We can stop at one factorial, right? If you ever see, if anybody ever asks you to find one factorial, the answer is just one, right? Don't try and compute any smaller factorials. Just immediately give back one. Otherwise, you're wasting time. Okay, so that's, that will be our base case. Does that make sense? 
one factorial, just call that one, we're done. And this, these two together, will solve our original problem, surprisingly. It will compute the factorial. And so, as computer scientists, when we solve problems, we write functions, right? We write functions to solve that problem. And so, if we have a recursive problem and we're solving it, we're going to write a function that calls itself on a smaller input it's got to solve itself on a smaller value. Interesting. Okay? So functions can be recursive. That's usually what you do in computer science. A recursive function must call itself because the problem is defined in terms of itself. The thing that solves that problem is that current function that you're, right now, that you're writing right now. Crazy. So here is how we will create our factorial function. So we'll say, let's call it fact. Def fact. Alright? Fact of n, ask for the factorial of n. So this will compute, compute n factorial. And what do you got to do? Well, to solve this factorial problem, you just got to figure out what case you're in. If you're in the recursive case, do this one. If you're in the base case, give back this answer. And so there, there will be returning involved. You just got to figure out which case you're in. So if n is 1, that means you're trying to solve the, for the factorial of 1. That's the base case. Return one. Base case. Return one. All right? If anybody asks you, they call fact of one, immediately the answer is one. One factorial is just one. Otherwise, else, this is the recursive case. If you're in the recursive case, your answer is you return your n times n minus 1 factorial. This is where it gets a little weird. We need to go off and compute n minus 1 factorial. Let's call that x. x equals fact of n minus 1. Here we are in the definition of fact calling ourselves on smaller input. That should make you feel a little bit uneasy. But it will work out because it's a smaller input. We call ourselves, and then the answer, right, it was always rn times n minus 1 factorial. Well, calling ourselves gives us n minus 1 factorial. That's what we're supposed to compute. So return, the answer, is rn times that x, n times n minus 1 factorial. Isn't that beautiful? So here's your call to yourself. It's called a recursive call, by the way. That's the fancy term for it. But inside of, for example, if you call a fact of 5 and ask her the answer, Fact of 5, so n will be set to 5. It's going to call fact of 4 for you in that recursive case and build up the answer. Crazy. Fact of 5 calls fact of 4. And likewise, fact of 4 will call fact of 3, blah, 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 etc., etc. And it's going to work out. So let me code this up for you in idle. This will be a very fun example because like, it looks like this shouldn't do anything at all. Factorial, you would imagine, should loop or something. The recursion will do the looping for us. This is lecture 27. Let's pick a folder for today. Um, side of it, and let's call it fact. Fact.py. And here's what we got to do. Everything we wrote. So, let's just copy it into here. So here's a function that computes n factorial. Def fact of n. Well, figure out what case you're in. Maybe we're in the base case. Return 1 if so. Else, you're in the recursive case. Oops. Oh, there's chat going on. Sorry, I didn't see any of that. Are people trying to listen outside of the classroom? <laughs> Are you all here who commented? I'll have to mark these people absent. That's not, that's not what you're allowed to do. 
You're not allowed to watch it outside of class. I'm doing this for the people in class. Oh, gosh. Zoom my screen. In the class. In the classroom. All right. Uh, X equals fact of n minus 1 return n times x. So you say print fact of 5, and it will end up doing the right thing. Watch. Run, run module. One twenty. That is in fact the factorial of five. What's well, five times four times three times two times one? One twenty. Isn't that beautiful? So literally, it's doing the computation. Print fact of five. The answer really is one twenty. Isn't that lovely? She's giving us the answer. And it might be a little weird why. Like, all right, let's try fact of three. That three times two times one, that's six. Six is the answer. Beautiful. And it's going to do the work. Why is this, why is this at all working is the question. Why in the world is this working? So, let me go to this fancy diagram called a stack diagram to prove it to you. Stack diagram is a stack of work. It's like a pile of papers, things that need to be done. Stack is a stack of work to be done. And uh, it also keeps track of who needs to get an answer back from somebody else. So who wants whose answer? Okay. So let me show you what's going to happen when we call fact of five. Like we say, down here in the outermost code, we say print fact of five. print fact of five. That's the idea. Uh, and then what's going to happen? Well, print needs an answer. It needs to know what to print. So it's going to go off and it's going to call fact of five. So fact of five is the next piece of work that needs to get done. And this is how you draw it. <laughs> fact of five is on top. And the person who wants fact of five, five's answer is right below it on this fancy thing called the stack. Right? Fact of five is us calling the fact function, and it has a value for n. n is set to five. It's going to create an x value, all that stuff. Uh, but this fact of five function, it's going to go here. It's not one. It's going to go to the else case, and it's going to try and give a value to x. Right? x is equal to fact of n minus one, because if only it had that answer, it could go and give back its final answer. It doesn't have it yet, though, so it needs to make room for x and then go off and ask for fact of 4. All right, so it's going to go off and ask for fact of 4. All right, that's the idea. And fact of 4 is going to go right here again. So fact of 5 called fact of 4. All of these function calls, the print, the fact, and the other fact, they're all working right now. They're all stuck. They all need an answer. They're not done yet. They're all executing at the same time. Fact of 4 is the one at the foreground. He's trying to do the work right now. But fact of 4 is in the recursive case. Stuck here again because it needs to know the answer to put in its own x variable of fact of its n minus 1. Its n is currently 4, so it's going to go and ask for fact of 3. All 
All right, that's the idea. And fact of three needs its answer to give back to the person who's asking for it, which was fact of four. Again, it's n is three now. It's going to go to the else case because it's not one. And it's going to have to go off and make an x variable. Compute fact of two so that it can return n times that. It's n times that. So it needs another value for its x. And this is just a chain, right? Fact of two is going to be called. It's going to need to put something in its x. It needs to go off and compute fact of one so that it can return that answer. And then so fact of two will finally call fact of one and watch what happens. This is how it's going to build up the answer correctly. Oops. Fact of one doesn't have an x variable. Fact of one, n is one. If n is one, that's your base case. Just immediately return one to whoever called you. So we return one back to whoever called us. That's right below us on the step. And then we're done with the work. We're back in fact of two. It was waiting right here. All right. It was waiting right here. And now it has a value to put in its x. It just got one back. It can put that value there. Can we see that? And then fact of two can continue its work. It's like, all right, I have a value for x. Now let's, let me return my two times that x. Cool. I can return two to whoever called me. And now we're back in fact of three. Do you see how this computation is unwinding? That's the idea. That's how it's going to work. OK? That is the beauty of it all. So fact of three, again, was waiting on fact of two. X equals fact of n minus one. That was fact of two. We just got our answer back. It was two. We put it in our x. And now we're ready to multiply our three by that two. So six is our answer. We give that back to whoever asked for it. That was fact of four. See how this is working? Slowly but surely, fact of four is, it's got an answer now. It's got an answer to put into its x. It was waiting for fact of three. That's six. We've saved it. It's ready to multiply its four by that six. And so it will return back 24. Fact of five. Isn't that beautiful? And so that was the value that fact of five was waiting on to put in its x variable, 24. No, oh, sorry. We're done with that now. Back in fact of five. It got 24 back. It can finally return n times x because it now has a value for its x. 24 times five is apparently... 120. So the original print call finally got an answer back for fact of 5, 120. It can then go and print, do its job of printing that value. All right? Sorry, we were back in print at that point. Are there any questions about that diagram? That's, this is how it's going to build up the solution. It's going down to that base case and just generating the final answer. It's building itself back up. Any questions about that? All right. Uh, yeah, that's all that I wanted to show us today. I hope that was cool. Like, this is a problem inside of itself. It's essentially looping without any loops. What? That's craziness. And it works. It's so cool. So, let me show you uh, information about your final, and then that will be all for the day, if we're good. So, reminder, you have a test coming up soon. We're in week 15, uh, week 17 is the last week of classes, and then week 18 is the week of the final. So let me show you the final info page. Oop, not ready with the final yet. Uh, we'll have to change the dates around, probably. But here is information about the final. All right. So the final, we have a dedicated time, right, because we, we're an in-person class. The final is going to be from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. in this classroom on the Wednesday of finals week. That's when it's been uh, scheduled for us. Please please double check me just in case I, I messed that up, but I'm pretty sure I read it right. Wednesday, December 7th, 4 to 5.50, so starting at class time. But it's an hour and 50 minutes total. That's how long finals get to be, apparently. And so that's going to be when. And then the what is, uh, again, I'll give you an essay, about 250 words or so to write. And then I will also give you Python questions this time. So it was very hard for me to ask you scratch questions. Now I, I'm going to give you Python questions. Okay? So remember to uh, prepare for that. So uh, 
the questions will be from like the programming assignments, the in-class examples, all those things are what I want you to study. Uh, for example, uh, I'll ask you to draw something on the turtle module, so make sure that uh, before you start the test, before you click start, you've got like idle somewhere ready to go. Get that installed. If it's not there already, because uh, you're going to be doing Python programming, or just go to the website where you can do all that. Uh, whatever you, whatever works best for you. Get a nice setup so that you're ready to do it. Uh, and then yeah, the majority of the of the points will go towards the essay, uh, just like the midterm, and just like the midterm as well. The test is open book and open notes, so you can you can look at all the slides that I've been giving you. Uh, of course, you can't talk to each other. That's the only thing you can't do, right? So yeah, are there any questions about that? That will be our final exam, the seventh, four to five fifty in this room. Any questions about that? Anything like that? All right. So uh, yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to show you. So thank you uh, for listening, and that will be it for the day. The rest of the time is yours to work. We'll continue our recursion slides uh, probably next week.